Norbert's going to be down in Maryland. Virginia someplace. He went down south somewhere. Down to Maryland. Maryland? Well, he's in Antietam. Yeah. He's in Antietam. Grab me a bottle of water. 150th anniversary of Antietam. You're okay. You guys are early or am I late? You're late. Marianne, I'm sorry, I failed you again, so I'm sorry. That depends. You I, I failed you again right about the minute, so. Have you got them done? No, I haven't got them done. I'm, well, we can I just broke up a fight in the park. You did? Yeah. That's a good thing I got out of there. <laughs> well, I don't think you would have been involved, I'm pretty sure. Why were you, were you involved? No, 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 there was a couple of guys who were going, who were going after each other, and Dave Reed and I went and explained to them that, that, Thank you. that was bad behavior. I loved it. I left the park about two minutes ago. Well, that, that's a uh, plastic park. I think, Bill, what we'll do is approve the minutes for July 16th and next yeah. month, grab the June. Hey, uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. You straighten oh. them out? Oh. <laughs> I just, I, I didn't straighten them out. I just explained that one yeah. of the guys I know is an ex-con, so oh. I explained to him I'm that sitting up. <laughs> he was in a pretty vulnerable position to be having a fight in public, so. See what I mean? He understood. Does he want to go back? That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed that he doesn't, so he's calmed down. So. Tommy, what was that date you said? Uh, October the 19th. Uh, we're going to open the doors at 6, and the show starts at 8. You will be absolutely blown away. And what's the name of it? It's kind of a, well, it's a salute to summer, but it's to postpone it, you know, it's to... Rescheduling of a salute to summer. So you will talk about that today. Yep. It'll be on the radio. It'll be in the newspaper. It'll be everywhere. How much are the tickets? Tonight? Twenty and thirty. Twenty and thirty. Yeah, thirty for reserved, right up front. If you want to sit up front? So where is it going to be? Upstairs now to VFW. Is that handicapped accessible? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be. But what we're doing is we're going to anybody that comes in handicapped is going to be able to watch it downstairs on a big screen. We're handicap accessible downstairs. Okay. I'll see what I can do about that one. Okay. Thanks, man. I felt like I got screwed. Oh, Look at the bottles. That's for little people. <laughs> Thank you. More plastic than little water. Little yeah. <laughs> right? I'll put it on Bill's knee. It just means there's more <laughs> water in the plastic. <laughs> exactly. 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 Well, he's going to need some serious cleaning. No, he just banged his knee. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to call the meeting to order, and I'd like to make an announcement that this meeting is being audio video recording um, by, I never know her name. Mary Likens for NorthAssociation.org, NorthAssoc.org. Sorry about that. That's okay. I would like... The approval of minutes for July. What was it? Bill? For July sixteenth. Approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The minutes for June eighteenth. Bill has apologized. Um, he has not had the time to get those set up, so we will approve them in October's meeting. Okay, I want to thank the Veterans Council of Northampton for being here again, and you've all been very, very active, and I think that's really good to show your visibility. And I also want to let you know that Adam Cohen for the North Street Organization does put that on the website. And anybody can see it. Okay. So we have Steve Connors here. And Steve, um, you probably want to leave or are you staying? Uh, I'm here for, yeah. Why don't you go for it? You want to talk about anything? All right. Um, in the Veteran Services Department, there's been some changes. Um, question is, we don't know how long the changes. Well, all right, let me, I'm gonna back up, I'm sorry. 
June of this past year, 2012, I was voted in and inaugurated as the president of Massachusetts Veterans Service Officers Association. So if you don't see me around, that's because I'm usually on the other side of the state. Uh, the last two weeks I've been there three out of five days. This week I'm there Wednesday, Friday. But anyways. Veterans um, Services Officer Association. President. President, yes. Um, I can't say it positive, but I can tell you that in August I got this sent to me while I was on vacation. And um, it basically, there's two new directives that came out of uh, the State Department of Veterans Services. One of them is reimbursement changes for Budget 3 and Budget 4. In other words, what it's saying is what I've been fighting for for eight years. The people that are up at Soldier On, we put them on when they first get there until they get CWT, they get their disability, they go back to work, whatever, they move on. It's been a big problem, not that putting them on was difficult. It was only 167 when I started, now it's $175 a month. So it's not like it's a lot of money. The problem was, is they would go up there two weeks, two months, sometimes two years later, they would go to another program. If they went to Pittsfield, then when my authorization ran out, Pittsfield would pick them up and they would handle the case. Same deal I had with Springfield and the same deal I had with Boston in the old days. Bedford, Worcester, Brockton, they all have programs and so does Baltimore. They wouldn't do that. There's a provision in the law that says wherever you came from, you own them for a year. It was impossible for me to case manage somebody in Bedford or Brockton. When you say they changed programs, despite the, it's a, it's just a different location. Yes, okay. yes. They, yep. they might they might be at Soldier On and going to a VA um, program for substance abuse, or they would be within Soldier On's um, program for substance abuse, but then they'd get into one that also had components that got them back to work, just like we have Cherry Street down here on Cherry Street. Yep. That's a VA program. Well, that exists in different locations. If they would go there, they'd still be eligible for the $175. But I didn't know if they were working. I didn't even know if they were staying there. I mean, I was chasing them around trying to find out where they were next, when did they start working. Sometimes we wouldn't find out for months. I worked hard to get it in legislation that passed under the Valor Act, and right after Memorial Day, the governor signed the Valor Act, which had a whole lot of components. Anytime you want anything happening with veterans in this state, it gets passed around Veterans Day or Memorial Day. That's when they pass it, that's when they sign it, that's when they get publicity. So it was one component. In that says <coughs> that cities and towns would now get a 100% return reimbursed to them, rather than the 75%, as in everybody else. What that allowed was the secretary to write this directive that says, not only are we going to give you back 100% of it, but if they come from one town to another town, it doesn't matter anymore. You pick them up right where in your community, because you're going to get all the money back. I fought a long time for that. It came out. This is budget three and four, is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah. So that's at hundred percent. Hundred percent now. Right. So anybody who goes to Soldier On, if I'm helping them out, I get hundred percent back. Anybody at Cherry Street program, we usually put them on for half a month until they get paid. Mm -hmm. We get hundred percent of that back. And if they're here, but then are gone somewhere else, then that town picks them up immediately. Okay. And I don't have to worry about them. Okay. So the hundred is up from up from seventy five. Yes. Everybody else is still seventy five percent, but just for those two budget numbers, those two types of veterans. Because they're so transient, they don't stay, you know. Yeah. Some of them do, but as a general rule, they don't. And so I, I then move, you know, they go somewhere else. So I close them out, and the next town picks them up. I remember, when was it, yeah. Counselor, when Angela was here, you had brought that up. 
hoping because you were really looking at I've been that. fighting that for <coughs> years and years and years because we put more people on anywhere else and outside of Boston and we were just well, that's very getting the raw news. ends. Good news. So, the other directive has to do with those bash vouchers I'm always telling you guys about. Yep. It's a Section 8 voucher. Now, <coughs> um, rather than... Um, they would come... They would leave Northampton and say they found an apartment in Springfield or Hoyoke or Pittsfield or mm -hmm. we've got Chesterfield, we've had Huntington. They need money to move in. Lots of times they need a security deposit and sometimes first time, first month's rent, and it's their portion of it. For three years, we've been doing it out of here yeah. um, to get them housed. It's, it's what we've done, even though they didn't stay in our community. We paid to get them out of our community, and then we didn't keep them on anymore. But we got them settled into places. Now that happens... If somebody gets a, uh, has a bash voucher and they find an apartment, it doesn't matter if me as a sending community comes up with that money or the community that they're going to. If you pay a security deposit the first month's rent, it's 100% reimbursed to the town. So okay. now it doesn't matter whether or not we do it. Okay, so, so it's anybody, because any, town. any any town can do it. If I send somebody to another town, okay, we put the money out, but we get 100% of that back from the state. So that's the other one. This is the first last you security deposit. Right. 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 So those are the two um, big changes for us um, and the Secretary of Veterans Services. Was, I met with him a week ago last Friday and thanked him very much for those uh, changes in the law. In the so, so, so Steve, you're presenting us <coughs> with good news. Yes. This is, and this will also facilitate you in, in projecting your budget out during the course of the year and then also add some stability and an right. absence of uncertainty. Of course, all you have to do is wait for the state to come across with money. Well, one of them has already been put into law, so it's it's, well, it's a question. It's about. a question of pro how fast they process right. checks. Right. I've, I've been on the receiving end of that and yeah. Yeah. waited a while, but that's... You can apply for those online, or do you have to physically come in for these vouchers and all this stuff? Oh, no, that's right? all. It's, it's for a homeless, chronically homeless, or you know, families facing yeah. homelessness, and you go into the VA worker and you have to... So you have to sit with somebody, it's a face-to-face... -face. <coughs> yeah, and then if they're looking for the money, then they come and see me or any other VSO in the state, and we process them by any other process, like anybody else who wants benefits. i got to do the whole application, I have to do the investigation, I have to gather all the documents, i got to get approval from the state. It's just, now we get 100% back for some of these. Do you have to do this person, or does... Rebecca, to do this with you. Who does? Do you have to do this personally yourself or the applications? Yeah, it's whoever's in the office who can do it. Yeah, um, one of those, I was no, about none that. of the volunteers can do it. No volunteer and no um, intern can do it. But Rebecca, but Rebecca, I, Joe Russo, or Juan are the okay. four that have passcodes to get into the state site to take these people's application. Okay. These these Section Eight vouchers are what known colloquially as sticky vouchers. These these go with them as yes. opposed to they're not site specific. They're, they're they not go with specific. they go with the family. Right. Okay. Wherever they go, they are to stay there for a year because they sign a year lease. Um, but then after that they can move from you know, the Northampton area. Right. They could go to Boston, they can go to Hawaii, right. if they want, if they can find a place that'll rent with the Section 8, they can move to Hawaii. So these are equivalent to HUD vouchers, but they're yeah. not. It, it is a HUD voucher. It's it a HUD, HUD Section voucher. 8 voucher. Okay. The difference between a regular HUD Section 8 and what the VA <coughs> is offering is it comes with a social worker case management. Okay. And now these new ones are going to be coming with a peer support person. So it comes with uh, different, services. more dedicated services that are yeah. uh, exclusive yeah. to veterans' issues. Mm -hmm. Right. And right now there's also a program called Mission West. Uh, that came from a SAMHSA grant from the federal government about substance abuse and those cases that are really, really hard because of substance abuse, they not only get the Section 8, they not only get a social worker, but they get about three other people that are all there to support them to see if they can keep them in housing. Substance Abuse Management Services Association, I think it was. Yeah, or? yeah. 
something like that. Yeah, I was yeah. just reading. I just uh, that is just online. for veterans, right? Yes, it's right. only veterans, not dependents or or. Now they're also. Oh. I was talking to Jonathan Height last yes. week, and I did not realize this. That Northampton yeah. housing takes yes. veteran preference in both places, mostly Hampshire yes. Heights. Yes, he told me, yeah. he said, if I knew of any veterans with family, that no matter what that list looked like, they go to the top. right to the top. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, it, it, was, it was done right after, that, those were built right after the war, after World War II. And that's when that was and in that place, was when it, I never yeah. knew that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I read this a year ago about uh, the governor's trying to end veterans' homelessness by 2013. And so yeah. it's been going on for a little while, and how do you think it's working out? Okay. It's actually, gen um, I almost called him general, Secretary Chinseki, Secretary of the VA. Yeah. It, was his, it was his plan, five-year plan to end homelessness amongst veterans. Yeah. Um, we're in year four. There's been a huge dent made, but they're not going to make that goal. No. They're not going to get it done. But there's another 50 vouchers um, being done here in Northampton out of uh, the housing authority here in Northampton yeah. for Western Mass. So there's more and more of them coming in. Um, the issue is, is making sure that they get out to all the places so that you don't have people moving from, you know, West Virginia to come up here to yep. get one of those vouchers. They'll have them in West Virginia. I mean, that's the whole idea is trying to end the homelessness within your communities. Um, I've made many, many referrals, and almost all my referrals have gotten uh, their Section 8. Yeah. Because they're, they're basically the VA wants to know who are the ones that are here that are homeless, not necessarily just at a homeless shelter, mm -hmm. but are they homeless? Are there issues right here? So I've gotten a lot of homeless families vouchers. How short? Steve, maybe you could give us an estimate of apartments here in the city that are we short or do we have enough to accommodate our homeless veterans? No, there's not enough. There's not enough apartments. Not affordable. And of course, with these Section 8 vouchers, they're also, you know, if the apartment's too expensive, then they can't move in depending on their income. Mm -hmm. It's 30% of their income. So... And then there's all the others who don't get these vouchers. I have two women with kids um, who are homeless, but I've made deals with friends of mine who have apartments that they have put them in. Now, one has finally moved. She's moved to a new town. The other VSO is going to pick them up. But um, there's, they're not eligible because they didn't do um, two years. They did less than two years, and they never went were sent into um, Iraq or Afghanistan. So they're not VA health eligible, and because they're not VA health eligible, they can't get these VASH vouchers. So I'm having to look for the regular ones. I'm looking into housing. So I've got a lot of... that. That's not going to end... You know, I mean, they're, they're still veterans, so they're still homeless vets, and they haven't figured out how to solve that. So. Now, like with... And I know Counselor Dwight was a big advocate, and I was too... When they, on Barrett Street, when all those apartments, the affordability was going to be taken away possibly from them. Well, it's uh, in the garden. It's yes, right. thank right. you. Yeah. Right. Now, we're looking at City Council of, an, of uh, another resolution coming out, or is it an order, an order coming in, also about trying to work with owners of keeping the premises affordable and it kind of worried me. I said, are we going back into this problem again? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not enough, there is not enough affordable housing well, in the, the city. But. The, the Amman Gardens thing case was, that was housing that was specifically built by HUD money for the purposes of being affordable. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and they were obliged for, <coughs> excuse me, 30, 40 years to maintain affordability. <coughs> but then under the Clinton administration, he allowed developers to get out of that arrangement early. And that's what happened. That property was going to flip to market rate, even though we paid for it to mm -hmm. specifically be affordable housing. And this, something similar happened with Meadowbrook as right. well. And as those 
and it's perfectly legal. The properties were now allowed by law, but the it was you know a lot of people thought that we were trying we were honoring an investment that we were that was made in our name to provide affordable housing with money with tax dollars that allowed developers to develop properties they wouldn't otherwise be allowed to develop. Uh, they took advantage of that and then in turn got to turn around and flip it <coughs> for market rate. So they realized and they could real they had the potential to realize a nice profit. We lost affordable housing, consequently or were in jeopardy of that and we had to do some rather two different elaborate schemes, if you will. Uh, the mayor negotiated for Meadowbrook and then mm -hmm. it, there was the uh, one allowed case in those the only circumstances you can impose rent control and that was the council had voted to in, in, institute rent control on that one property because it was federally subsidized, it was paid mm -hmm. for by our tax dollars. Um, they never got that far. There was that kind of impelled them to broker a deal. Which is no longer standing by the way from what I understand. That doesn't so those those units are not available uh, in the same level of affordability they were before. But there are people with vouchers there, with sticky vouchers, which, which actually Those are the Hamden. Hamden Gardens now called um, Hathaway Farms. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Changed yeah. names three times, but yeah, uh, Hathaway Farms. And the same thing with Meadowbrook. Meadowbrook is right. back to allowing those. And right. There is a lot of tax subsidies they can get to put people in, just like up on Hospital Hills. Right. Because the city paid a bundle for that affordability restriction. Right. It's, 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 it is an ongoing... I mean, the other problem is, is then what's left is just SROs, and our, and our SRO inventory is it's much depleted from what it was even 15 years ago. Yes, uh, unfortunately, with Augie's going with Augie's, with the loss on Green Street, yeah. loss on, on uh, Bay State conversion, yeah. and uh, um, a number of other conversions that have so so consequently, and and many of those were uh, housing for veterans. So, and one other thing in the housing field. Um, I'm on the Western Mass Task Force to end homelessness because I'm trying to keep the veteran perspective in there. And what's been good is we've been working with DMH, the VA, and everybody so that it's a regional approach and not, you know, it is one of those things, well, if you build it, they will come, and there's nothing you can do about it. I'm helping out in Amherst on a very local level because they're talking about, you know, SROs and stuff like that, and they want to say, well, and, but we only want it for the homeless of Amherst. Yep. Well, if they're homeless... They, it's where you sit. Right. Where you're and home. Legally, you can't say you have to have roots here, otherwise, you can't do that. So, we're looking at it regionally, and no town is exempt anymore. Roots it's like, or stakes. Right. Ten so, stakes. So, um, I'm also on a the state steering committee to end homelessness amongst veterans, and we've got a four year plan that we're developing, <laughs> and there's an event October 4th. Um, at the Clarion about the homelessness pro problem and the steering committee's going to be having a, a, an event there. I am running one of the programs and so that's Western Mass, all of Western Mass will be coming to that meeting. That was on it. October 4th? Yes. And and ask you. that's a Thursday we have city council. Yeah, I might be asking the wrong question to the wrong person, but the, what is the percentage <laughs> of returning veterans right now that are homeless. I've read 10%, I've read 13%, I've read as things as low as 5%. Uh, no, it's probably between 10 and 13%. That's Number right. one in the second issue is, is that it used to take the Vietnam vet, it was anywhere from 18 to 22 years to go into homelessness and then, you know, yeah. another 30 years before we housed them. But um, with the returning veterans, it's 12 to 18 months. Okay, and it is before between 10 and 13%, which is what I, I, I just knew five percent wasn't covering. Right. But from uh, all I've been told is, is it's ten to okay. thirteen percent. Thank you. And that's so across all 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 um, terms of service. I mean, that's so that's including in that census the Vietnam vets, Korean War vets. No, no, it's no. A, that, no that's, that's just all IFOEF vets. Right. vets. Really? Yeah. No. Yeah. Because they're all getting discharged and they don't. It is. If yeah, they don't have any jobs, or it's been taking the VA. There's another court. Thing going against the VA because their caseload is 910,000. They got it down below a million, but I've got one case in Amherst. It's on month number 25, waiting a decision. All, all of the 
Uh, the, the studies. Sorry, no. All of the studies on homelessness, they all have percentages of, of, of why they're homeless people. What percentage of the event do you think would be mental illness? Do you have any idea? All of, me all of the homeless? Yeah. Oh, boy. It's of a homeless IFOs right now. Yeah. Any, is there any, uh, is there any data on that? I think there I looked may for it, be, I couldn't find it. Yeah, I, I don't know that. I know that of the, um, of the veterans, not the LIFOEF vets, when the program started, before they had a whole lot of the homeless coming, it was uh, a significant amount because they had been homeless for years, and so some of the mental illness was just yeah. untreated things that they never dealt with. Yeah. And so, but a lot of the homeless now with the OIF, OEF vet is mostly unidentified PTSD and TBI, traumatic brain injury. So that's, it's a mental illness like anything else, but it's, it's, you know. I, I, I guess my question was, I know the homelessness, homelessness studies that we have, homelessness in general, mm -hmm. there's always a percentage, and it's yes. always almost exact from study to study to study, yeah. the percentage of poverty or mental illness or, or whatever, just those that want to be homeless. Right. And I was wondering if, if you knew what the... Yeah, I don't. For the we could, you know, if you send me an email, I'll try to see yeah. if I can talk because I'm in so many homeless yeah. committees right. and stuff. We okay. could find out. I could try it's find it's out. a big question. I just, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the last thing I would report, because I'm probably long-winded here, is um, currently we got voted in to cover the town of Middlefield for two months until they have a special town meeting. They don't see that there's any problem, so they will be joining the district. And we are offering, we have been covering the town of Hadley for two months, and they are paying monthly. Um, we are proposing them to also join the district, but we're going after one of the um, grants out of the state of Massachusetts. I tried to do it last winter, didn't have any takers. This year, I'm, this time, I think we will have some takers. Um, and it's a grant from the state, innovation grant, for um, regionalizing services and stuff like that. So we're going after that grant uh, with the mayor's office to allow Hadley. And we're offering it also, the district wants me to offer it to West Hampton, South Hampton, Huntington, and Blanford, I guess. I don't know. But, Are yeah. you comfortable with that? Is your office comfortable with it? I, I'll have to hire staff, which will be... That's what's going to... Which will be covered by those towns. Right. Initially, it's going to be covered by the grant, right. which gives them a chance to try it out for a year. How yeah. much staff? Hmm. I'm going to have to hire another uh, part-time person between 25 and 30 hours if I get all those towns. It's, it all depends on which ones want to go into it. And that's so be the covered by the grant? Yeah, for one year. Hmm. And then after that, they would pay their share like every other town. I'm currently in Middlefield and Town of Adley are both interim. They yeah, they're on a month-to-month so -month right now. They don't, the select, I went and presented and talked to the select board, and they voted to <coughs> have it go until the special town meeting, but they don't, they only have 521 people, so they don't think it's going to be a, a difficult thing. They've been without services, and they really want to professionalize what they're doing. When do you have a sense this grant will be that you have? The grant has to be going in by November 30th, okay. and then they'll decide after that uh, for the first of the year, but... Um, that's why we're saying just do month to month, and then we're going to offer it to the other those other towns because they're BSOs. <coughs> so if we get all those towns, and I have to hire, really look at, mm -hmm. and then the supervisor all those, some some of the case management can be tough. But well, at least it's a grant. Yes, because, because well, if it was coming out of our budget, that could be a problem. Right, and I did I did explain that to the mayor that if that did occur and we got bigger, we're going to need a different office. Um, where are we going to put you in there? Well, that's the question, because Memorial Hall is where we like to have it be, but there's really, I don't know how we would do it. Um, so some There you go. <laughs> I have to talk to Dave Pomerantz about that. He's back He's there. here, too. <laughs> oh, there he is. Yeah, so um, if that does happen, we're going to have to get into the office, because as, as, as it is, we now have people on little desks trying to work I on the office. I see that. It's so, so cramming in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I wanted to ask you about this um, veteran <coughs> service office, what is it, Officers Association, and you're the president of yes. it.
How many days a week? Do you well, do it, it all depends on the event. Um, so I'm involved in some state steering committees on homelessness. Some of them are long standing that I've been part of. But there's also meetings that happen at the 600 Washington that I have to be at because I'm the president. I chair the meetings in Marlboro. Mm -hmm. And then there are ceremonies like the Gold Star Mother event that's happening. It's on a Saturday. I'm the president, so I either have to go or get my vice president to go um, if I can't. But it's important for us to keep up with all the different things. So I have, some, I have a ceremonial role. And there's the POWMIA event this Friday at the State House, and I have to be at that one. So okay. that's some of the trips to Boston. So how many days a week are you in this office, would you say? A couple? A couple. About a couple? Right. Okay, because so then I also good. cover Amherst sometimes, right. and I'm responsible for the other. And you have sometimes. somebody who covers you, correct? Well, I have Wonder Woman, so... <laughs> I do. I have Rebecca. Rebecca. She, oh, she's sweet. Yeah. She, and she's very good, and what she doesn't know, she just gets on the phone and calls me, and we talk through it. Now, Steve, do you think you should be back for maybe like the month of December? Sure. That way I can report on how the grant went. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put you in for 5 o'clock because I think that time is good for you. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. All right. For December 17th. Okay. All right, sounds good. And you know what? If you haven't gotten that information on that grant, we can book you in January. Okay. Just call me. All right. Okay. Have nice holidays. Nice Thanks. See you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Is it the World War II? This yeah. World War II. Yep. 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 You going to bring those books back? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I want to thank um, the Veterans Council for being here, Tommy Pease, Brad LeBay, um, I think Tim Daly, and Erwin Brady. Erwin Brady. Brady and Tim yeah. Daly. Right? Yeah. Thank you for being here again. Okay. Who's going to speak? Tim, you want to fill us in? Sure. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, we've got two uh, major events forthcoming. Uh, November third will be our annual salute to veterans. That's going to be at the Elks Lodge at 9 a.m. on November third. Guest speaker and program is in process. Tickets will be available after. They're already available. Oh, I guess, yeah, Jerry. I got, I got two already. Okay. So uh, the tickets will be available at $11. Uh, we're not saluting any individual veteran. It's for all Northampton veterans. Um, speakers, everything is intact and stuff. And we moved there from Smith School because... We had to pay for janitor, had to pay for uh, a kitchen staff to be there so the caterer could use the kitchen and everything else. And the Elks are just going to charge us a small cleanup fee. So, And the that. parking is a heck of a lot better. And yep. uh, the caterer is using his own kitchen. Out. So, and What time is that? 9 o'clock. 9, Nine o'clock. Yep. yep. We received all of us counselors in the mail about the Veterans Day Parade, and mm -hmm. also it had language in it about the breakfast. Right. And it did state that tickets were available in the Veterans Office, so I had gone in there on Friday, mm -hmm. and the girl could not find them. They were in Norbridge. Yes. Norbridge. I know all about it. it. <laughs> yes, I so heard about it. She went, and she looked all over the place, and I said, you know, you mailed out letters to us, yeah. saying to us to mm -hmm. come and pick them up. Yeah. She found them. Yeah. Right? Okay. And I said, well, you better keep them out so people know where they're at. Yeah. But they'll be available at uh, the Elks, at the Legion, at the VFW, and anybody on the committee will have tickets. So. Even at the Legion in Riverside? Yeah. Oh, good. We'll have tickets there. 
and Elks Legion in Wales. BFW. 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 And World War II, I hope. Yeah. And uh, all we'll members. Get, well, we'll get them down there. Oh, and any of the members of the committee. Yep. Okay. Guest speaker, Tim. Well, at this point, until we have our next meeting, thank you for that. Uh, until we have our next meeting Monday night, I can't burn that up. So we we do have a speaker <laughs> for a short program. For the breakfast? Yeah, and we have a speaker. And I, I just want to comment uh, about what we did last year when we moved the ceremony into the park to get people from standing out in the roads yes. and everything else. Yes. And I I really think that we made a smart move. I think so. I know it's away from the monuments and it's away from the front of the hall, but not last year, but the year before, I mean, people were standing halfway out in the main street. Mm -hmm. Traffic and everything else. And we got concerned because there was little kids out there running around and everything. <coughs> and by moving it into the park, I think it's a lot safer issue for the community. A lot it was warmer. Zero that year. Yeah, yeah. it was zero, and Mike Ryan was speaking. It was freeze, freeze. Yeah. Right, and you had the metal chairs oh, the in your room. I ain't tell me about it. Oh, it's, it's, it's better awful. inside, really. So, yeah. uh, uh, actually, doing it on the side, it gave us a, a better position for the firing squad to fire so. at the monuments. It gave us a chance to have the cannon where we should have had it. And I think it worked out much better, and uh, the committee feels that we should do the same thing again and probably, you know, continue an improvement. It's uh, a work in progress. It made some sense. It did. I think it was a very good move. Yeah. Thank you. No. And Momo uh, the Veterans Day Parade on Sunday, yeah. Later start. because November 11th is uh, on a Sunday, yeah. the parade has got to kick off at 12 o'clock instead of 11. Okay, that's right. It's because it's of the First Church and Edwards, Edwards Church. Church. Edwards Church, yeah. Edwards Church. Uh, so, in respect for their services, instead of 11, 11, and kick off at 11 o'clock, yeah. we're going to kick it off at noontime. Okay. Which will probably make it a little warmer anyway. Right, so, so yeah. we'll start at down there with Lambert North. Park. Yep. In front of Bridge Street School. And if any of the city officials are going to need uh, a vehicle to ride, uh, Norbert usually has vehicles. The only thing you have to do is contact them. Okay. All right? Yeah. Uh, and that's about the end of our events until uh, next spring. That's it. Up until next spring, so we won't see you now. January, December, January, February, March. Well, we'll... Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll be miss here. you. You yeah. might have, yeah, we'll but you might have some we'll, things on your agenda. Unless Tommy come and come talk to us. If I they talk, do, Brad. I'll, I'll be talking. i got some more stuff in the works. I know, Brad, if yeah. there are things that come up, you should call me and let me know so we can yeah. put you on the agenda. So, yep. Uh, yep. Right. Right, basically, Tommy. it's been a good year. We've had uh, our major events. and uh, Well, we do. We, we're going to revamp. We're going to redo some of the flag day stuff. Jerry Clark is going to now share that. Yeah, well, yeah, but that's, you know, June. that's in June. June. That's, yeah. uh, I, I've got October 18th listed here for a meeting with you. Uh, council, is that a council meeting? October 18th yep. is a city council briefing. Yep. You yep. come to city council. Erwin, myself, and Brad talk. will be here to give a, a brief of the parade yeah. about, about, yeah, the about the yada yada, yada. so we will see you yeah yes. yeah and then i have on here november 1st coming back mm -hmm. to city council yep a november reminder one. a reminder of the veterans breakfast and again the parade exactly do you want to, you want to hold to that oh yeah, yeah. okay, we'll just, okay. So you'll get us on the agenda. You'll get us not the two three times. minute, not the three minute thing. Well, we'll get it on that three minute thing. <laughs> presentation. Oh, you mean bullets. we don't like the restricted time. Yeah. Are you talking about a presentation? <laughs> I'll do a presentation about the breakfast. Yes. 
I'll that's have the, that's, I'll have the speaker's name, the time, and the parade. Bah, 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 and that's parade. for October 18th. Yep. Yeah. And, and November 1st. And November 1st. November 1. You want to go on that? Because you said you wanted to do open mic. That's what I have on here for November 1st. So I'll wanna... do open mic on November 1st just as a quick reminder. Is that it's what you want? You. Sure. It's I don't want to bottle, bottle you up on the agenda. I mean, you're only going to take what? <laughs> I know. Oh, I've heard of that. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I'd rather be on the agenda just so I can field any questions from the, yeah. the counselors. Right. But we also have Pearl Harbor Day, too. Yeah, we're going to be doing Pearl Harbor Day right. also. Just like we did at the flag. We're going to try to do so it every year. Can we put them on for no October 18th? We already know they're doing a presentation. And November 1st. And I have down the last time they mentioned to me about 10 minutes or so. I know. The Veterans Day and the salute to the Veterans of Breakfast. And I was also told that it would be Brad LeBay, Tim Daly, Tom Pease, Erwin Brady, and Norbert who would be attending Norbert. that one. Then on November 1st, we're looking at doing a presentation, mm -hmm. okay, for how long? Maybe five minutes? Well, give me five minutes. Give us five minutes. That's all. That's not a long one. No. Uh, no. It's just a quick reminder the Vets Breakfast is going to be followed in a couple of days. Pearl Harbor Day. Pearl Harbor Day went well last year, and that was that was an event that we had. Now that's Tom. I just have you. Yeah, I'll just do that. that. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they can come if they want. Mm -hmm. All right. I now, Brad, first. you were talking about something else coming up. Oh, I just that was it. That Pearl, was Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor Day. We picked up last year, so we'll do it again this year. At the uh, bridge. At the bridge. Pearl Harbor. At the bridge. We dropped the wreath over and had a fire in yep. the lot and yep. a field room. What day is and, that? And they had... Uh, what day is that, Bill? December 6th. December 6th? December 7th. 7th and 7th. 7th. What day of the week, though? Friday, I think. It's a Friday. I think it's a Friday. Yeah. I'm not It's positive. a Friday. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And what time is that? Uh, it's going to be like 12 o'clock they we, dropped the we, wreath because 12 o'clock made the it was 8 coordinated attack with, at Pearl Harbor. With the... The See, we, we do Harvard. it with East Stampton. Yeah. East Stampton Legion. Is That's there. right. I remember that yeah. when we went remember down there. Right. You should talk about that, Tom. I will. Right. guys. I right. One of your guys talk about that. I will. Put that in the paper. Yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, no, no. And I'm taking care of I will also be taking care of Tom's the press secretary. Yeah, he will eight o'clock there. Do a wonderful it, job on this. eight o'clock in Hawaii. He'll have it on TV. Or seven o'clock. Whatever. 12 o'clock corresponds with the time of the start of the attack. Yep. Okay, so and we'll have two seven. firing squads. We have two firing squads, right? Sure. This year. Okay, so December seventh, twelve o'clock yeah. at the bridge. At the bridge. And, uh, and Tommy Pease will talk right. about that on November first. Right. Right. Going back to the Veterans Day parade, yeah. uh, Jerry Clark and I will not be here for the parade. We are attending the ceremony at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C. on behalf of Northampton and the council. Oh. We'll be presenting a wreath down there. This year it is the 30th anniversary of the dedication of the wall, the 25th anniversary for Rolling Thunder, all the motorcycles, and the 50th anniversary of the actual start of the war. So oh, that's great. it's a big celebration. Jerry Clark and I will be there presenting a wreath. Thank you for going. Yeah, well, we both have ties to the wall, so we both want to be here. Twenty-five years for Rolling Thunder. Mm -hmm. They want a million bikes. Yeah, they're going to try to get a million. They just missed it Memorial Day, and they're going to try Veterans Day to get a million bikes there. Hmm. Did, I, uh, did I let you on uh, October eighth? Uh, the Polish parade. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did I? Did you mention that? Thing? No, Columbus Day? Yeah. No, Columbus Day. Yeah. What time is that at? Ten? Yeah, that's the Polish parade. That's at ten off of King Pulaski Street. Day. Off of King Street. That's uh, Pulaski, uh, last year, Day? Pulaski Day. Last, last year, year uh, we had a few of us from the committee made a, an effort to get there. And, uh, it was our first time. So it was, we march uh, it every year. It was appreciated, you know. So yeah. Yeah. Sure. We'll be doing it again. In fact, I'll try to get, change the I'll try to get our color guard to go. It's going to be right down at the... The, the French church. 
That's where they're going to show up. Well, they have their ma their memorial mass there, and that's where the parade starts. Right, but they used to have it at the old Polish church. Right, right. Well, they had it at the French church last year. Yeah, last year was at the French church. King Street. You were there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try to get a color guard from the BFW. I just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Thank you. I've got one thing. Uh, I just received an invitation today in the mail for a luncheon at the Korean attache's office in Boston on the 5th of October. I, I, I went to it before. Every few years they have one. And uh, I went to that one. It's really nice. And what is it? It's the Korean attache's office for... Korean War? The yeah, for time. Korean War people, yeah. Uh, noon time? Uh, I'm not sure. Probably. I'm, I, I don't October remember. 5th on a Friday? It's on a yep. Friday. Yeah. Where's that being held? Pardon? Where's that being held? Where? I, it's Korean at one Council. of the bigger hotels down there. Yeah. I just got it today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. I went to it once before, and it was a very what I, nice... What I see, Marianne, is a lot more recognition. Nice. There's a lot more activity. I do, too. At the three county fairgrounds... We had a booth set up there, and I had a Vietnam car there. I put in probably over a thousand kids in a car. Sam Adams was there with a little dog tags. I told you about the yes, needs program. Yes. Raised one thousand eight dollars in, really? in 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 three and a half days. The first day he ran out of the dog the tags. There were two hundred of them sold, gone. He raised four hundred and fifty three dollars for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial out of a little jug we had there. Now. Kudos to Three County Fairgrounds. They let us go in there for nothing, for nada. Here, set it up, do what you want. They let us promote. They let us collect money on the premises. Um, they probably raised another, I think it was 125 for the VFW, another 125 for the Women's Auxiliary at the VFW. People were firing out money, like uh, Sam would be asking them, hey, you want to help the vets? They signed up another 30 Vietnam veterans that knew nothing about their benefits from the VA or the DAV, and they signed them up through the DAV. Mm -hmm. So wow. it was That's a wonderful. lot of work, but it was well worth it. And again, I'm going to send a letter to the Three County Fairgrounds to Bruce Salcross, but uh, I want to let the council know that they went out of their way. They didn't have to let us on the premises, sure. not That's only right. collecting money that was going to be taken away from anything they were doing. Mm -hmm. So it was all good. Yeah, and they allowed the World all, War II truck You can there. see where it's all starting it's to starting, connect. It's starting. It's starting, it just starting takes time. to connect. And look at how long it has taken. Yep. <laughs> it's, not just, it's not just about war and everything. It's about community Connecting and about veterans. And the community is you know. working together. Right. Yep. You're doing it. Well, it's good. It's all good. It's to help them. Yep. Yep. That's what we're here for. Anything we can do. Oh, one thing. The uh, veterans, uh, all the folks that went on a tour, they're getting invitations to the breakfast, too. Are they really? So they, uh, That'd be nice. We've yeah. lost a few. We've lost, a We've lost uh, two. I think three. three of them. Oh, George. George, George Broder. Uh, and Ed Moran's not doing well. Ed Moran is not doing well. Oh, really? His father, his boy, came in and saw us about a week oh, and a half ago, two wow. years ago. Yeah. Ed's not well at all. I want to thank the Veterans Council for everything that you've been doing for our veterans, working together with our city. I mean, we're coming a long way, and I really appreciate that, and the whole committee does. Just keep up the good work. And like I said, if something does come up between that you feel is so important, call me and we'll I'll get Tommy and you yeah. and Tim and Brett, all of us back in here. Because we're still meeting twice a month. Twice a month. Twice a month. Okay. We meet two or three nights. So. Okay. We Thank rotate you. from first our uh, second Tuesday of the month we meet at the Legion and the fourth Tuesday of the month the committee meets at the uh, VFW. You guys have really breathed some life into this, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's taken us what? Have I been on a committee, active on a committee of like seven, eight years? Yep. And you know, it started and it's tremendous. Well, well you know, if you can the thing that happens is once you get some volunteers that want to work, yes, it it makes a difference. It's I like mean, it, it was like a stone wall before, yeah. and 
Well, you've got to get new people in. Right, too, that's the that's time. the big ball yeah. game right there because what new, happens is new blood. people get tired. They're doing yeah. the same thing over and over, and you get the younger ones coming in now, yeah. just like with the Elks. We have new faces coming are. in. Right. Energetic makes a difference too. Yep. And they're it, done it, there. It relieves the pressure. Yeah. Yep. But thank you. Thank I've got another thank you. Thank coming you. in. Thank I you, folks. Appreciate our yeah, thank you. I'll see you at the breakfast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Careful with him. Yep. Okay, Peg, David Pomeroy, I'm going to have all of you just come up with a tool to help me, Eugene. I know it wasn't hockey, but did you watch the Patriots game? Help me come get some chair. Help me knock out. Let's get some chair. Steve, so, you want to? Soup. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Peg. Sup? Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. I sometimes might have to hold back. One change in the. Uh, Who's here because Pam, who was supposed to be here, on the yeah, agenda is, was sick today. Wait a minute, we can't do this. I got to get uh, Pam, who was on the agenda, yes. to come with us. It was sick today, so we recruited Lois to take her okay. place. Okay, okay. <laughs> Representing the mental health services. Did you catch one Lois Raj, our agent. Okay, um, I'm going to open it up to David Pomeritz, who's the Director of Central Services, Pat Keller, Housing and Community Development Planner, and Susan Stubbs from ServiceNet. We thank you very, very much for being here, who is the President and the CEO of ServiceNet. Wendy Payson, she's like part of our group all the time. Thank you for being here. And she's the Director of Communications Relations from ServiceNet. Um, Ian White. Hi, thank you for being here. Is the development coordinator and office manager also responsible for FERC ServiceNet's fundraising? And before, I think, Wendy, you were in charge of that, correct? Mm -hmm. So now we have a new fundraiser. <laughs> and um, Michael Tremblay, thank you for being here. He's the case advocate, shelter and housing division. I'm glad you're here because I would like to get somebody in here in November to talk about the shelters. I think that's the right time to come in. Okay, so we're going to have David Pomerantz. We'll go ahead and start talking about the Grove Street Inn. Okay. Thank, thank you, David. You. Thank and you. thank you for everybody for sitting back. I mean, these guys come in, and they, they're working so hard. So. so when I was last here with Peg, we talked about the uh, program to paint the exterior of the building. Uh, that was a piece of the community preservation funding that we went for along with the interior remodeling of the bathrooms and some other work about two years ago and yeah. it wasn't funded. Um, so we're at a point now where um, using some block grant money that, that Peg has through community and uh, development funds, uh, the plan was to <coughs> scrape uh, spot drawing and paint the exterior of the building in fiscal 13. Uh, we did the project back in, I want to say late July. We had nobody show up for walkthroughs, uh, which I find ironic because this was right around the same time we were bidding the James House painting project, and we had six painting contractors show up for a walkthrough at James House. Mm -hmm. So the James House project is proceeding also with block grant funding. Um, and my plan is that once we get the contract signed with the uh, bidder uh, who's going to be doing the contract, who's going to be doing the work at James House, I'm going to contact the painters uh, who bid that project and do an, a walkthrough and see who's interested, as opposed to rebidding the whole project and taking more time, uh, two to three weeks before we actually got a walkthrough. 
schedule. Nobody showed. Nobody showed. Up and they're the all RFP saying they're, they're hurting yeah. for jobs. So you didn't go forward with the RFP or was that? There was there was nobody to uh, uh, yeah. even then turn around and then bid the project team. So um, I mean it was a detailed scope. Everybody knew yeah. it's, it's an in town property. Um, not one person showed up. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I saw the paper. I can't, guy. I can't believe it. it. Yeah. So all is not lost. Uh, I mean, the funding is there. Peg and I would work on the contract, get that done, and I think if we don't have an early winter, we can probably still get the job done this fiscal year. Oh. Uh, so that's the plan as far as the painting is concerned. Okay. We're really doing no other work on the building at this point. Um, you know, again, everything we did with the CPA money was completed, mm -hmm. signed off on. Uh, I've been over there several times, and the bathrooms look good. Uh, they're wearing well, and. Um, we can get the painting done, like I said, that would be a, you know, a plus before winter sets in. And then would we look next year about the porch and so forth? Peg, okay, you want to address the porch? Can we just clarify, the funding source for the painting is actually a private donation? That's what I thought. We were waiting I to thought see it was a resident of mine who donated it. We were them. waiting to see the uh, what the quotes came in as to see if that donation was needing to mm -hmm. be supplemented or mm -hmm. not. Um, the porch situation was looked at by Soldier On. They had submitted a cost to us to provide um, the materials, and then they would provide the labor. And the strings associated with having that happen um, are beyond the time capability that I have to figure that out. So um, I told them it was it was actually going to be more trouble than it was worth to have them donated donate their their labor so I think it's uh, probably not an outrageous amount of money that I think we can probably find after the first of the year the CDBG program is getting a lot of program income that yeah. we didn't anticipate so I'm thinking that we can just cover it ourselves and just follow the city contractual process and okay. try to make it as humane as possible so I did express our gratitude to Soldier On for following through with your request and told them that I would let them know, let you all know that um, it was really just going to be a nightmare uh, involving several departments um, passing muster. So I think it's just easier to do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll tackle the porch in the spring. Um, that would be nice. I think between if we can get it painted and the porch done, would come a long way. And I thank you, Peg, for yep. working with us very closely on Grove Street End. Do you guys know anything level. else from Danielle as of late that, that uh, any concerns at the building that we need to be paying attention to? Okay, good. I, I would assume that I would have heard if there was something. Wasn't the kitchen cabinets also brought up? Yeah, and? I remember that. And, Maybe ask around a little bit at some point to see if we could find any donations. Yes, I, I, I contacted our, the team at Home Depot, um, and I got a, really the runaround um, there. And they have a new contact person, but even the new contact person did not get back in touch with me about that. So I think maybe to go to a smaller outfit might work that's more community-based. Because I think at that meeting, when Danielle was here with us also, when you were here, because you did bring up, I have all the minutes, mm -hmm. that you did bring up about cabinets in the kitchen, mm -hmm. hopefully that we could be looking at that. And I know with John Downey, when he was here, they said, well, you know, they know so many people that there was a possibility they could help the city out of locating some cabinets. Mm -hmm. Because I have to say, they do need to be done. <laughs> There's no question about it. We have kicked this cabinet thing around for what, a year and a half now? Well, no, more than oh, that. Yeah. Peg and I and more than that. our committee have been working on that place for a while. But you're right. You've been here almost, you yeah. I've been here almost three years. You're right. It's been going on a long time. Yes, yeah. it is. When the, when the bathrooms were renovated, the contractor, Garland, um, for several months after they finished their work, other jobs were just putting feelers out. They were looking for cabinets, uh, medical offices, kitchens, you know, other projects that they or other companies that they worked with. 
mm -hmm. and they never found me. Now, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, it's a new school year, so probably the volume of work would be less than if we waited until next spring, but you might want to contact the physical plant at Smith College. Okay. And if they're doing any dorm renovations or faculty housing renovations, faculty club renovations, um, they might have some cabinets that are, are still structurally sound and, and, and cosmetically good um, that you could put, put a feeler out to see for next year um, that could be used. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll definitely do that. Physical plant. Uh, plant plant facilities, they call them. Yeah, right down uh, on West Street. Yeah, sure. Or another <coughs> option is maybe we could contact Smith Boat and get it sent onto one of their woodworking projects. Do they have that other department store? They still have that department card. They do, yeah. Do you like something in the box? Have you guys... Um, Ever dealt with uh, eco building folks in uh, Springfield Salvage? They're a salvage yard. John, I've forgotten his last name. Um, they do a, a, a lot of projects, community based projects, with uh, building salvage. At the same time, also sell building salvage, too. So they, this sounds like a project they might, yeah. might be right in their wheelhouse. So. And what was the name of that? It's called Eco Building. Eco building. Associated with CET, it used to be uh, renew, it. renew, yeah, in in Springfield. Uh, <coughs> they're they're, uh, they're focused on uh, you know uh, sustainable building systems and stuff. There, so worth a shot. Yeah, I, I want to apologize because I should have really introduced the counselors that I know. Most everybody does know them. Um, I, I'm the secretary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's our I'm designated secretary. I did it for two years. Painful That's typing right. speeds. Um, our council president, councilor at large, Bill Dwight, um, councilor Eugene Casey from Ward 7, and I'm city councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6. Okay. He's the only one technically advanced. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Well, we can put our heads together on that and kind of try to revisit it so we can just kind of get this building wrapped up and um, it really is to be perfectly well to be perfectly honest, this is just there's so much other work. ServiceNet's struggling daily to try to find the funding to keep their programs operational and you know, we're just inundated. This is just not a project that's on the front burner, um, to, to be honest. But just so we don't continue to come back and talk about it for years to come, you know, we'll, we'll try to just focus now, on it and get it addressed. When you say, Peg, that service net, okay, is apparently what? We're working hard just to keep the programs operating. You mean, kitchen cabinets just like have coming not over to on. Grove Street in, and is that what you mean? All the all the programs that. All the nonprofits are running these days. Resources are just drying up right and left. So there's so many other things that people are focused on that this has just not been at the top of the list. I know, but that house was in deplorable condition. And you were very happy with our committee for stepping in and putting that place back to where it should have been because it was so neglected. You know, so to me, I think we've come a long way. And if we can find cabinets and somebody donates them, why not take them? It's just a matter of finding the time. Your, your plate's going to be actually pretty full come January 1st if sequestration comes to realization. The well, mutually shared fair. destruction yeah. by the <laughs> Congress, which will result in across the board cuts in all social service programming, federal monies, and then consequently state monies that would be allocated in the defense cuts, although there seems to be a big scramble to preserve the defense funds, but the social service programming doesn't have advocates that are quite as zealous. And consequently, I suspect that what we're looking at is a dark winter, if that is to be realized, if we have that. And cabinets will be the least of our problems, I think, ultimately, when it comes down. But it's certainly something we can be working on. 
Yeah, exactly. yeah. It's, it's like, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean she can get it for nothing. Why not? That's your job. That we can certainly follow up on. It but too. by the way, we the, own the building. Let's not forget that. Right. We understand that, and so. we had a big responsibility peg, like Councillor Casey was saying, that was let go for how long, Councillor? For quite a long time. By the way, uh, it's John Grossman is uh, the contact guy for Eco Building. Right. Okay. And he's. Well, I'll go ahead and follow to, up on those three suggestions on, yeah. you know, and see what, what come, we come up see, with. Because I mean, he, he wants a higher visibility in Northampton anyway. We can tell him that this is, this is a great way to improve his standing in the community. And, and by all means, <laughs> you can say I sent you. Okay. You can your cabinets. So, <laughs> so maybe between Tom and our guys, if we can find him, we can figure out how to get him in. Mm -hmm. I know <laughs> Tom's pretty straight out. <laughs> We'll make it happen. <laughs> and you figure if my resident does donate that money for painting, which that had happened before, it's going to make a big difference. Definitely. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The porch, a paint job, kitchen cabinets, that's about it. Those are the last things. I know, because I remember when Ray LaBarge went in there, oh my goodness, Bill. <laughs> Him being a plumber and all that, he knew exactly what was wrong. And it's all been taken care of. With yeah, the upstairs Howard bathroom Hunt. is the <laughs> Teach you Taylor Howard Barge Hunt. Memorial bathroom. <laughs> 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 what, are we going to put a plant up or something? <laughs> <laughs> we got to do that. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, he was up and down the stairs. I was holding on to his belt loop so he didn't catapult down the stairs. <laughs> now, we were going to uh, put a plaque in one of the upstairs bathrooms dedicated to, to Ray. To Ish. To Ish. Yeah. The ish. ish. Remember that the thing? How concerned? Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. And it behooves us to wrap it up. I absolutely hear you. Yeah, yeah. before the next we'll, session. We'll do our best. Okay, anybody else? Susan, how about you talk? Okay, so do you want us to? <laughs> you can say Segue whatever into, you would like. Into it's um, your agency. Okay, well, we, we were asked to come and talk about the whole agency, kind of do an overview. So, do you have the uh, handouts? David, thank you very, nice. very Good much. See you see us. Oh, they already have them. See so, the next meeting. We brought, yes. um, we brought a brief um, agency history, um, which is the one page or page and a half, um, or just one page, I guess, uh, history, which you can look at at your leisure. And this, is, this brochure is a draft. It's an update of, we just updated our... Um, we call it Guide to Services, which is kind of an overview of the whole organization. And it's just a draft, so you, you'll find some errors in here. But we thought we'd bring it instead of wait, instead of not waiting. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> so don't don't uh, worry about the typos. But no. it's, um, it's an overview of the whole organization, which I thought we could briefly walk through. And then um, we have two people here to tell a brief story about some people that we serve that typify our clientele. So... Um, We've grown over the years, as you'll see if you look at the history, and um, our revenues are now about $42 million a year, and we have about 1,100 staff, and our service area now includes um, parts of Hamden County and Berkshire County. Typically over the years, we've mainly, where our headquarters are in Hampshire County, we've mainly served Hampshire and Franklin counties, uh, although as you'll see through the reading the history, we've merged with some a couple of organizations and expanded through... <coughs> Um, a collaboration with the Department of Developmental Services, which used to be called DR, <coughs> Department of Mental Retardation. Um, you're probably most familiar with our shelter and housing services because of the collaboration that we have with the city. But actually, <coughs> our largest division, our largest service area now is um, the Developmental Services area, um, serving people with developmental disabilities. And uh, we now have 35 group homes throughout the <coughs> region serving people with developmental disabilities. Most of the um, homes serve four or five individuals, and they're, um, they look for all practical purposes like um, a family home. Um, and we try to keep it very home-like. And uh, most of the houses have staffing around the clock. And for most of the folks that we serve, um, their needs range, actually, from needing help with um, simple things like bathing and dressing and mm -hmm. um, food preparation and so on to behaviors. Um, some of the folks we serve have difficult behaviors, so they also have mental health issues. 
and some of them also have physical disabilities. We have um, a couple of our houses are fully um, handicapped accessible and have, um, in one case, people on oxygen and uh, with all kinds of enhanced uh, medical services. We have round-the-clock nursing in one case. So it runs the whole gamut. Um, Susan, who owns, what agency is on Glendale Road? Because um, those two sons now, the mother, I don't want to give out names, the mother lives next door now because the sister was moved out to another place up in Amherst, and you know who I'm talking about. Her two sure. sons now. That's not one of our programs. That is it? I don't know who. It might be Nanata. You think it's Nanata? No. There's another um, agency, <coughs> Nanata, that you're probably familiar with, that has their headquarters here as well that operates some homes. Um, and there's a couple of other ones. There's, um, there's um, Guidewire and... Um, hmm. uh, About a half a dozen. That, one, that house is 24 hours a day mm -hmm. of staffing. Yeah, our, most of ours are as well. Yeah. And I'll just briefly walk you through some of the other service areas. Um, our second, um, actually after um, the Developmental Disabilities Division, uh, the two other large divisions are large service areas are clinical services. We have five outpatient um, mental health clinics now that run the, that provide the full range of mental health services, including psychotherapy and medication services. We, we um, employ a number of psychiatrists and people um, with a whole range of needs, ranging from people with serious mental illness who need to be on um, pretty heavy duty psychotropic medications to people who need um, temporary help with depression, anxiety, and it could be working people, your friends and neighbors. Um, our clinics, some people are under the misconception that it's just a publicly funded clinic and that all we serve is Medicaid and Medicare. But actually we take 200, if you could believe there are that many, um, health insurance plans. So almost any plan that anybody has, and so we serve a number of working people and their families, people, family members that are on their spouses or parents' uh, plans can also come and get services. And we, we have developed a reputation over the years of um, being one of the best places to go if you need mental health services. Um, contrary to popular belief, just because poor people go somewhere doesn't mean that it's low quality. Um, and what we've managed to uh, do, and the reason why it is high quality, is that because we have a large number of, contract, of, of people that come through public funding, um, we're able to have a large number of clinicians. We have over 200 psychotherapists, and many of the therapists that have their own private practices in town also work for us part-time because we are able to take more insurance companies than they can, and it's, it's a lot, it's a big, ha a big uh, hassle and very expensive for private therapists to get on all of the panels and become part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield and Health New England, and um, most um, people, social workers, actually can't take... Um, Medicaid or Medicare unless they're part of a practice that has other professionals like doctors and psychi uh, psychiatrists and psychologists. So many of the private people also work for ServiceNet part-time so that they can see a wider range of clientele. So because we have so many people, we have specialists in almost any area. So if someone has an eating disorder or a marital issue, we have um, people that have that expertise. And when they come to us for an intake, they get an evaluation by someone and then they get matched up with the best expert. So they actually get better care than they would if they went to a random private practice that only has two people and the chances that they would have that specialty is lower. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, are, we do have a reputation for having uh, excellence um, actually in our can psychiatric services. Can somebody help me out? There is some agency, that maybe Bill, you might know, or you do know down by the old Pro Brush Company, before you exit into Bliss Street, Starlight or whatever it's called. Oh, that's the, that's the, the HRC. Um, yeah. What is it called? Um, that's a, um, it's, a, it's a rehab club where people with mental illness go and go and um, spend the day and engage in um, some vocational and some counseling and case management services. And what we is it called? Starlight? Starlight. Starlight. We partner with them. That's run by an agency in Springfield that runs several clubhouses around the valley. And that's their expertise, but we partner with them. Um, so it's a rehab clubhouse. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a day community program. center. It's like oh, a community okay. center where yeah. people go in the day. Many of the 
people, the next uh, service. But they're center. really dealing with your agency, correct? Well, mo most of the people that they serve are also receiving uh, their psychiatric services, their okay. medication well, services, services, and their residential and um, okay. other services from now service. I got it. So <coughs> there are partners. Um, what I'm, uh, just ask you a quick question. I want to back a little to the, yep. the brain injury service. Do you receive, are you uh, awarded any of the, uh, if you get a speeding ticket now, there's a $50 surcharge on your ticket for brain injury, mm -hmm. and then there's a seatbelt law. Do you receive any of those funds? Yeah, we do. You yeah, do? Actually, yes. I was always wondering, because I, I, people have called me to complain that they got a ticket or something, they said they get, there's a brain injury uh, surcharge on the ticket. Yeah. And it's, um, there are several of those. It's tobacco settlement. I can't give you all the details. I don't know exactly how the money is administered, but we do get both the tobacco settlement money and that money um, for some of the outpatient services. And we also have part of clinical services, as you'll see there, is moving forward, which used to be part of the Amherst um, Men's Resource Center in Amherst. Mm -hmm. um, they decided to get out of the business of service delivery, and they came to us a couple of years ago, actually, I think three years ago now, and uh, wanted another agency. They were, they were shopping around for another agency to take that on. And uh, so through them, we also get uh, money from court that, that's allocated from the courts. Yeah. So that's okay. called moving forward. And then yeah. we have um, the Counseling for Victims of Drunk Driving, yeah. supported by the Office for Victim Assistance through the Drunk Driving Trust Fund. You can see it right there. It's uh, listed right above our developmental and brain injury services. Yeah. Actually, the brain injury residential services that we provide are part of the division that has all those group homes I was talking about. And some of the programs, a few of them, are for people with brain injuries as well as for people with developmental disabilities. And then um, we have another large service area, which Lois is going to talk about, actually one case, uh, one person that she worked with, works with, uh, from that division, but we serve um, over 500 people with serious, very serious mental illnesses that um, we get funding for them through the Department, State Department of Mental Health, and um, that, that covers both Franklin and Hampshire County, and also there's a special separate program for young adults. Um, the, the state decided to separate out those individuals in, in, in order to not mix them with people who are more chronic. And um, these days, people tend not to have long hospitalizations. Many of the people that we serve who, who are older had spent time in Northampton State Hospital. They tend to mm -hmm. be chronic and older um, and have different kinds of issues from younger people who have, these days, when a younger person has a first psychotic break, we try to keep them out of hospitals and we try to have them directly come to our agency and get a package of services, the right medication, and get uh, outreach services. And in some cases, they can continue to lead it, live independently and go on with their lives and get their education and whatnot and not become chronic and institutionalized the way they used to in the past. <coughs> so um, we have these 500 people. We serve them in a variety of different ways. It's flexible services. The contract we have with the state is called CBFS, and it stands for Flexible Supports, Community-Based Flexible Supports, CBFS. So um, we decide whether a person needs a group home, 24-hour uh, care, or whether they need, they may just need to have someone look in on them a couple of times a week, and then if they get worse, or we keep an eye on them, and if they need, if they start to, um, to uh, relapse or to need more services, then because they're in contact with uh, our staff, we can then bring in more services, and in some cases they could move to, we have some respite beds where people can stay temporarily, mm -hmm. and uh, a whole range of different services we help them. We've been focusing more in that um, part of our service area, we've been focusing more on the whole person and on work, which is really important, getting people back to either um, whatever their vocational interest was, or get them back into school if they if that was interrupted in their lives. Mm -hmm. And we're also focusing on their physical health, which uh, more and more the thinking is that there's a connection between physical health and mental health. So um, we did open a gym, which some of you know about. I was just going to ask yeah. you about that. Yeah, I'm really depressed about my weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, well, we've, um, we've had a big focus on tobacco cessation. It turns out that... Um, a really shocking statistic is that 49% of all cigarettes smoked in this country are smoked by people with either a drug addiction or a serious mental illness. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and our, not 40% of the smoke, 49% of the smokers, but 49% of the cigarettes. 
and you would be amazed to know how many cigarettes some of our people manage to smoke. I don't know how they get the money for it. It may be um, that they're not eating or <laughs> whatever because of, with the cost of cigarettes these days. So we're focusing a lot on that, both mm -hmm. from an economic perspective and also from, from the perspective of their health. 78% uh, of Europeans smoke. Yeah, so on yeah, TV today, 78%. Well, yes. So does that mean that they have some kind of a disability? <laughs> no, it's not saying oh. that. Just in this country. <laughs> I think we've done a pretty good job in this I think, country. I think you better walk down and educating <laughs> people. And the American Medical Association has really taken it on as their cause to, start to reduce smoking, at least um, right. to re harm reduction approach, get people to smoke fewer cigarettes per day and that sort of thing. So I think That's great. a lot of people have cut back. and. And our, our population that we work with um, doesn't, uh, not, uh, has more trouble but with it. But you, you do correspond with self-medication. Yeah, I mean, there is some benefit, yeah. uh, some <coughs> soothing that happens through that. But And, and the, the myriad of challenges they're facing them every day, the last thing they want to do is endure the stress of quitting smoking. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's true. Did you end up with anybody from the Northampton nursing home? Yeah, I know. I know. The other thing about cigarette smoking that I didn't realize until recently, that we've all been, our staff has been educating ourselves about this, that uh, for some people, that, that tobacco uh, actually reduces the effectiveness of other medications, even caffeine. So it's common. Sometimes, like coffee. Sometimes when people stop smoking cigarettes, and they're used to drinking two cups of coffee in the morning, that will have the same effect as four cups of coffee. It's the, the impact of their drugs. And in some cases, when people stop smoking, they can reduce the, we, their doctors can reduce the, their um, psychotropic medication, exactly. which is great because a lot of the, um, them, those medications have side effects. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. We also, and gonna, plus the exercising, too. Yeah, that helps, too. I mean, if you look at some of them, okay, people, their obesity, yeah, that's another issue. We've worked a lot on um, helping people eat, eat better diet, you know, more nutritious food. That's great. So um, I want to get through this quickly so we can hear the stories. But um, just briefly, we have a range of child and adolescent services. We also have um, three recovery homes for people with addictions up in Franklin County, up in here. The addiction services here are run by another agency. Uh, we also all the shelter and housing services. You know, we have 10 um, shelter and housing programs throughout uh, Franklin, Hampshire, and North Worcester counties. And you can look at this at your leisure. We also have Home Care, which is a visiting nurse program focusing on our clientele. They specialize in working and doing home care when needed for people with the other disabilities and issues that ServiceNet, um, ServiceNet's clientele have. So you're really so, moving forward though, Susan. I can so see some so we, movement. We, um, we have a, you know, a, a pretty comprehensive range of social service programs. And you can look at this at your leisure and, as I said, ignore yes. the typos that you may find. I, I, I <laughs> want to thank you and all your staff, all your staff at ServiceNet, <coughs> for doing what you're doing for people with disabilities. Because it's not an easy job. I mean, I worked all my life with people with disabilities, 33 years. And it's not an easy job. And um, I think you've come a long, long way. And I think we have that great connection in the city of working together, mm -hmm. which I feel there's a lot of value. Yeah. The only thing I haven't heard, excuse me, Councilor, is that I know, Wendy, you had handled it before. And now, are you going to be doing that big fundraiser again? We were actually going to talk about that. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Council, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have. Uh, you were not the recipient of any of the residents of the Northampton Nursing Home, were you? When the North, Northampton Nursing Home closed on Bridge Road, no, did you? No. None whatsoever. Okay. No. Thank you. What is the plan for that? Is it? There is no plan no. at this point. Uh, it start. It gets worse and worse and worse, and worse every day. Oh, so, oh. it looked good. They kept it up for a while. Uh, but the yeah. um, there's a segment of the community that that traditionally falls between the gap and this gap kids, basically. You, you, the, and I know that this is true for Mike, but this, there's a certain age group that's more or less covered. There's that nether region of 18 to majority age that tend to be the couch surfers, the people actually at the time when when uh, mental illness, for the most part, starts to manifest in adolescence mm -hmm. and starts to create bigger problems. And the, they traditionally have been, they've, well, they've been stuck in the gap. They fall mm -hmm. between the cracks. Is, do you guys have any 
programs in place that are trying to address that, yeah. that particular at-risk group? Yes, DMH has funded us. And now, this is, this is people who have, they have to be identified by DMH. The parents or someone have to get them uh, to DMH and get an evaluation, then they qualify. So it may not address people who want to stay away from the system, but if someone or their family wants them to have help, um, DMH did um, create this, what I mentioned before, this young adult, it's called TAY, Transition Age Youth, and it's actually for people 18 to 24, although we stretch both ends a little bit sometimes. And uh, those people are served separately uh, from the adult DMH-funded services, and uh, we, we do focus on trying to get those people back into whatever it is they were doing, get them on the right medication, do a lot of outreach, do some family work. Some of them have family therapy in one of our clinics. Um, we've had quite a bit of success, actually, with some of those folks, getting them back um, into whatever it is where they were going in their lives prior to becoming ill. And a lot of it does hinge on getting people the right medication and having them be willing to accept services. The ones that aren't are likely to be the ones that you see. Yeah, Maybe you could speak to that. Well, we've seen a, a real big uptick in um, clients between the ages of 18 and 24 uh, in the last year or so. <laughs> Real big uptick in um, a lot of heroin addicts and the same young kids. They're coming from middle class, upper middle class families, and it's making them homeless. The one, right. of, the, one of the things that is um, very troubling to me, and um, there's one thing that I lie awake at night about, worrying about, it's heroin. And I, you know, the, the police chief came to speak to Rotary Club, which I'm a member of, um, mm -hmm. recently, and I raised my hand and said, you know, there's so much heroin in Northampton High School. How is it that we can let this happen? The kids know where it's coming. They know how to get it. They, it's there. It's kind of open. And he said, we don't have enough time and money to uh, address it. And I said, oh, my God, if there's one thing that should be at the very top of the list for our police force, it would be dealing with it. I brought that up at a council meeting several times but and have had my head stands. handed to me by the school department to tell me that there was no problem with oh, drugs in their school. I wish the Christ you I was. If you send one kid... I got kids in the high school, I know. I, I had a kid in the high school a while ago, and it's worse now. She graduated in 2004, and it was there then. But I guarantee you that if you give me two kids from another town and you send them into the school within two days, they'll have they can buy find out how to buy heroin. You've got to be kidding. The, now, the heroin the heroin accessibility actually correlates directly with our involvement in Afghanistan as a primary source. Whatever for the in Mexico, I mean, tell me about well, it. Well, I mean, the, the bulk of the the upsurge you can see the ebb and flow of heroin use in the community, and, and depending on what little adventures we're we're prosecuting, all the flow of it. it, it of course. I yes. mean, and when, but then it's always supplanted with something else. I mean, Do if you know your heroin it were to, to get addicted to heroin, two weeks. That's it. Two weeks. Or or sooner. And your entire sure. life is ruined. It's a physical. It's not something. You know, a kid can be a good kid, and they can just you know have a bad boyfriend for a little while, or be you know an adventure. Some kind of it can even be sort of a good thing. Somebody's a little curious, and some older kid says, "Oh, you can't get addicted that easily," or something, and. They get sucked in in a couple of parties. A couple of two weeks, their yeah. whole life gets ruined, and you can't stop it. There's I've, something I've wrong with us. If the adults in this community cannot stop that heroin, we ought to be punished for it. I'll tell you, we <laughs> had a presentation done at City Council. Karen Jarvis Vance and what's his name, Johnson. Glenn Johnson. Yes, yeah. <clears throat> and they did a whole overall drinking versus marijuana. And drinking was more of a problem. Well, that may be, but heroin is the problem. Marijuana and drinking are not as big a problem. It's heroin. It's opiates. It's not just in the Northampton High School. It's, in, it's in every high school. Oh, I know. I'm right. not saying it's yeah, just No, no, I get it. No, but, that, a, but that was never brought up. Yeah. This is a real debate with me. I, I've hired better than a dozen, and I get them actually from uh, Sheriff Garvey or uh, from different agencies. Kids on heroin. And um, out of the dozen that have worked for me in the last five or seven years, three have died. Yeah, they, they, they have overdosed. Sure they, they die. Yeah. The, and there's no way out of it. I mean, no. it's, it's, it's a disease that kills and kids we have, rapidly. We have yeah. recovery homes, and the, you know, no matter how good your services are, it's one of the most persistent types of illnesses to cure, and there are very few people who come out of it. 
Is and it's not really poverty kids, kids either. Doing no, it's like it's I said, anybody. we're we're seeing kids that are coming from good families. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's any it's anybody. But these hmm. kids in it's the anybody, homeless, adults they too, have no right? idea what they're in for. No. They do things know. to get that those drugs they would never ever even think of. Absolutely. But they're doing them. Sure. And it's just like I said, this past summer was it, all you have to do is just look out the street and you see all these groups of people and mm -hmm. most of those are a lot of them are our clients. Um, there's so many young people. We, we've never had it like that. Uh, there's just so many. I young don't know anything about heroin <clears throat> at all. And I did not realize that it only takes two weeks. Or less, you said, maybe. Yeah. It's, it's very seductive. It's very, very... And it's a physical... I mean, people... The people who are addicted to it, they don't want to be anymore. I mean, well, once they see it's it. It's the nature of most addictions. Right. There, yeah. It's a physical dependency, yeah. including tobacco, alcohol, yeah. and all the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Even can, can, I you, the, can I ask you a question about, um, I ran into this in a personal situation, the, uh, a client, it wasn't a client, it was a friend, I mean, I don't have clients, mm -hmm. um, had uh, acute schiz schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And the problem was, the big problem was trying to get him enrolled for insurance because he... The process was everything that he was, he was very paranoid, and mm. the process was exactly what a paranoiac would expect to be yes. drawn into, asking yeah. you very personal questions in, a law, in an office. Is there, and, and consequently, he never, he wouldn't get the insurance, and consequently couldn't get the services that were subsidized for mm. that. And he since died, not, not as a result of that, but, mm. well, actually indirectly, because he didn't, he didn't he work well enough to choose treatment for cancer. So, th but the thing is that there is that gap. There are people who, another gap, similar to the gap we were just describing, but another gap that's described by, that, that's established by the fact that to get to that one point, to get the funding for the services, in order to get the services, they can't get beyond the, the stuff that, well, gives the best of us fits. But, yeah. you know, it's one of the biggest challenges. I'll tell you, I've, I've been to a number of um, national conferences where family members of people with schizophrenia have spoken and it's one of the biggest challenges that families face when they see their loved ones sick and yet they don't want to get help because they're, they're paranoid and it's, it's, a, it's an almost unsolvable dilemma. What the best uh, advice to give anyone is to try to join with that person, be as supportive as you possibly can, um, validate their fears and so on and hope that through a relationship like a friendship they would trust a person enough to, you know, a family member or someone to um, help them get enrolled or are, to see someone to go one time to a doctor. Are there funds that are available for interim services before uh, uh, insurance is provided? Somebody could get um, DMH funded services without having insurance. Without qualifications. If they went to the primary <clears throat> mental health, and those people maybe are a little bit less, they're clinicians. Right. So they're not just um, somebody filling out a form right. and asking a bunch of questions without kind of having people skills necessarily. So if you um, <clears throat> referred someone to, to the intake worker at the Department of Mental Health, that person would maybe have a better clinical, um, would have a clinical background, a better ability to join with that person and get them into DMH funded services. And then maybe through working with us, we could then get them to trust um, a therapist uh, or to trust our workers enough to get them insurance, and then that would pay for... for um, well, sometimes also that um, <coughs> if someone presents a, a, some very salient thing in the community, like a danger to themselves or others, they might be hospitalized, and through the hospitalization, they might be connected to DMH yeah. services. And that process can And then get and insurance. insurance. But insurance that, that's that the way. determination has to be made by a police judge or a doctor. Well, uh, but yeah. a lot of times when when someone is very paranoid or they have other symptoms of schizophrenia, they, they will present a problem in the community <coughs> and then they might be evaluated and, and seem to be a, at risk either to themselves or But others. it does have to reach that threshold. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind yeah. of sad because somebody has to really... Um, hit bottom before the system will scoop them up and get them services. But, you know, short of that, they can get DMH services if they're willing to go talk to someone at DMH. Um, and then maybe through us, and through us joining and connecting with people and making a therapeutic relationship, we could get them to, um, to get health insurance and then to go to a doctor and so on. But it's a challenge. 
and even people that we already have relationships with who already have insurance sometimes stop taking their medication because they suddenly get paranoid and they think someone's poisoning them, the medication. A lot of these medications have side effects, as we said, so mm -hmm. somebody starts to think, oh, they're poisoning me because I gained weight or I did this, or you know, I, I, I'm trembling from it, and they um, stop taking it, and then some of, for some people there's sort of a cycle of going off their medication. And, then and even if they have insurance, too, that there's always renewal, like people, we have uh, folks in our program who are on Mass Health. They have Medicare, and they'll get a renewal form in the mail. They'll never give it to us. Yeah. And then they lose the insurance, and then that's, oh. and the whole process has to begin again, which is very troubling as well. We, well, should, move, we should move to. Um, yeah, I've just knocked yes. you guys off straight with my questions. I appreciate you taking time for that. No, so that's good. To to us. I tell a brief story first about that's somebody that he worked with. Hello. So okay. this is just one of many, many stories. Um, Dwayne first showed up at ServiceNet's drop-in in September of 2007. For years prior, he had been living outside in a tent, drinking himself to an early grave. Dwayne was born and raised right here in Florence, but his childhood was anything but typical. Almost from the time he was born, there were drugs and alcohol in his life. His parents were young, and they partied heavily. Throughout his childhood years, his mother's solution to any problem Dwayne might have was to give him beer. Uh, when he was two months old, she would put beer in his bottle to help him sleep. After all, that's how she and, her, and his father handled most situations. So Duane grew up convinced that drugs and alcohol were the solution to just about everything. Um, after high school, Duane joined the Air Force. He had a keen mechanical sense and was sent to Hawaii to become a helicopter mechanic. Unfortunately, his emotional issues prevented him from being successful at, his t at this task. Again, he turned to alcohol, which ultimately resulted in, in being discharged from the Air Force, which in turn caused Dwayne to just drink even, have, even more. Um, Dwayne spent most of the 80s and 90s living in jail or living on the streets. With one brief stint in a veteran shelter in Boston, by this point, his mother had died from alcohol-related issues, his brother had committed suicide. Uh, he didn't have much of a relationship with his father. He had two failed marriages and a, and a son. He had no friends. On top of it all, he had been in a major fight and was hit over the head with a cinder block, causing a serious head injury. His overall physical and emotional health was declining at a rap very rapid pace. Basically, Dwayne had nothing going for him. Nothing, that is, until he walked through service net's doors. When he first came to us, we gave him a bed at, at our interface shelter. Unfortunately, Dwayne's drinking continued, so we had to ask him to leave. But he still came back to the drop-in center several times a week. We helped him get into detoxes, but each time he, he got out, he would start to drink again. In between detoxes, he'd be in and out of jail. His life couldn't be more of a mess. But then in the fall of 2009, something different happened. Dwayne entered a detox, and this time, when he got out, he maintained his sobriety. He was attending AA. He came back into ServiceNet's shelter and really began to deal with his issues. ServiceNet provided counseling tailored to his specific needs, and it was working. ServiceNet's consistent support and Dwayne's positive attitude blended very well. And in March of 2010, Dwayne moved into a room at our single room occupancy unit in Florence, the Florence Inn. Mm -hmm. um, today, Dwayne continues to go to AA meetings. He is involved with the pedal people and their bike shop. Um, he basically runs their bike shop on Saturdays. He volunteers, there it is, every day. <laughs> he volunteers on Saturdays at his bike shop. This past winter, Dwayne got a position at ServiceNet, in ServiceNet's peer work program and is actually working at the drop-in. He is an evalu invaluable member of our team, uh, and his willingness to share his life experience is making a significant difference in the life of, of others, many of, them, of whom he used to be his drinking buddies, which is just so huge, and I see it every day. Mm -hmm. Dwayne was recently accepted to Westfield State College, where he is seeking a, a substance abuse certificate due to the help of ServiceNet and his willingness to put his life back to get together, Dwayne has come 
has come an incredibly long way in this, his journey of sobriety. Service Center has been at the Wayne's side every step of the way, offering su support and encouragement. And we will continue to be at his side for as long as he needs us. It's been an honor to work with Dwayne. His incredible strength and spirit is truly an inspiration. This is Mary's story. <clears throat> I'll never forget the day I first met Mary at North Kansas State Hospital. It was 1993, and she had been referred to ServiceNet's Amherst House, where I had been the director for the past eight years. At 44 years old, this tall, rather heavy-set woman with sandy hair and glasses <clears throat> had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Though I had read her record, I wasn't quite prepared for the vacant stare that was so intense it made me uncomfortable. Though she showed little emotion, Mary was glad I was there because she wanted nothing but out of the hospital. My initial visits were short and frequent. As we gradually became acquainted, she told me a little bit about her life on the streets prior to coming to the hospital. I brought her pictures of Amherst House so she could get a feel of what it would be like to live there. She began to have dinner visits at the program as well as a couple of overnight visits. She and I went out, went, she and I went out to eat several times. Mary's early years were incredibly difficult. She grew up in a small town in Indiana. Her family life was tumultuous. Her mother was cold and distant, and Mary reports that she was often cruel and physically abusive to her. Mary's reaction to this treatment were some episodes of antisocial behavior, including some instances of violence. Her father seemed overwhelmed and frustrated by the family situation. This was probably the early signs of mental illness. At 17, Mary began college with the ultimate goal of getting a law degree. The symptoms of mental illness were getting increasingly worse and interfered with her ability to concentrate on her studies. <clears throat> Ultimately, Mary lost complete control and physically attacked her mother. This episode led to a four-month stay in a state hospital. When her symptoms were more under control, she was released and returned to college and graduated with a bachelor's degree. <clears throat> After graduation, Mary worked for the telephone company for four years, but was eventually fired when her symptoms interfered with her ability to keep up with the work. Not wanting any contact with her parents, Mary moved to Massachusetts. It wasn't long before she ended up living on the streets. After eight or nine years, she was committed to Northampton State Hospital. As part of the deinstitutionalization, Mary was referred to ServiceNet's Amherst House Group Home. And this was a major change for Mary. She became part of a household and learned to control her frequent angry outbursts. The kindness and understanding of the staff was a new experience for her. Mary's ability to form a close bond with selected individuals was a benefit in her feeling comfortable at the program. That was 18 years ago, and she's been there ever since. Over time, she learned to take her turn with other residents doing household chores and helping with the cooking. She formed close relationships with some of the other residents. She had, and she became an enthusiastic participant in the special holiday celebrations and game nights. <clears throat> ServiceNet had truly made a big difference in Mary's life. After she had been in the program a couple of years, however, it became clear that something was missing. Due to her violent behavior, Mary had no relationship with her parents after her first hospitalization. She hadn't seen her parents in 25 years, and so desperately wanted to see them. I believe it was important for Mary to reconnect with her family to gain some peace and resolution. With her sister's help, Mary uh, connected with her parents on the telephone, calling at first monthly, then bi-monthly, then weekly. During one of her conversations with them, she asked me to speak to them, and I asked if she could come to visit. At first, her parents said no, absolutely not. They were uncomfortable and fearful of the idea. But after a couple of months, when I asked again, they said she could come if I would come with her. And so we made the plane trip to Indiana together. All went well on the trip. While Mary wasn't able to resolve all her issues of the past, she was able to find some closure. As it turned out, that was the last time Mary would see her mother because she died a year later. 
Mary made a couple of more trips alone while her father was still alive. She now returns to visit her sisters every year. I have to admit that reuniting Mary with her family was an immensely satisfying experience for me as well. Mary has benefited from psychotherapy at ServiceNet's outpatient mental health center. I remember when she came to us, she had difficulty taking a shower. Therapy helped her to become less fearful of showers. I know this sounds like a small thing, but it was a big accomplishment for her. Just one of the many baby steps that gradually transformed Mary from that frightened and frightening person I first met years ago at Northampton State Hospital to a calmer, happier person. While the atmosphere of the program had a calming effect on Mary, I cannot downplay it the effect that medication had on her as well. ServiceNet Medication Clinic worked hard to find the right and most useful combination of med medication for her. <clears throat> Today, Mary has many good friends in the community and an active social life. Every year, she spends a couple of days in Maine with the program staff and a program friend, and she takes frequent trips to Tanglewood in the summer. She enjoys listening to music in the comfort and quiet of her own bedroom. And recently, she was hired at a as a receptionist in one of ServiceNet's programs, where she has received many accolades for her fine job performance. I have felt privileged to be part of Mary's recovery. Through my years at, of work at ServiceNet, I've had the opportunity to witness what a difference our clinical and support services can make in the lives of people like Mary. My position at Amherst House has shown me again and again that the safety routine and companionship of living in a group home can be an incredibly healing experience for people with mental health challenges. That's great. I think, Peg, didn't we meet Mary at one Shun Stories? Um, I don't think no, so. I, no. no, I think we she had some. She had dark hair. No, uh, she, she's not come to one. No, I think um, no, huh? some other people that we serve have been to the program a few times. Right, but we just saw a woman speak, but she also works there now. Oh, right. That's Tim. That, that, that yes. was the one that was supposed to come. She's unbelievable. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, she, came. she was ill today. It was unfortunate. Did you ever meet her, Bill? I don't think so. Oh, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. what, what is her position there now? Tam? She's a regular staff person. She's a, she provides peer support to other people. <coughs> Lois, I was trying to remember um, Mary, that's not her real name, but she still lives in, in the Amherst House, and I was there not that long ago with a group of people from our board of directors. We were taking them on a tour of some programs, and she said something, which I wish I had written down. She, she was there, and she was actually talking with the board of directors, and she was saying what a great program it is, and she said something like, Lois took the bad out of me. Lois took yeah. the evil out of me, or something. Yeah, she said something. What did she? Do you remember exactly what um, it was? Not exact words, but something like that. And I mean, sometimes she says that um, you know I prevented her from harming other people because yeah, she, she was had, sort of violent. She, she, had, she violent. had a lot of violent thoughts. And huh. It bothers me because if she was a patient at the North Dayton State Hospital and she was afraid of water, mm -hmm. getting into a shower, mm -hmm. something's there, okay, that she's had a bad experience with getting in the shower. Could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. But she actually didn't, she did attack her mother once, and she had, most of the, most of the violence was in her mind. She didn't really right, go around right. hurting people, but she was afraid of her own mm -hmm. thoughts, and, um, so she said it was so poignant when she said Lois took the something out of me, the violence or the evil or the bad or something. Well, one thing could have happened at, at home too prior to the hospital. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah, as sure. a child or something like yeah. that. Yeah. We dealt much with Carlson recovery. Yeah. So. I brought a kid there mm -hmm. and I had to pay for it. So he wouldn't get any. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. And uh, they sent me money back. They sent me the check back. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, and he eventually moved to Florida. He was a maintenance heroin user, maintenance dose every day at noontime. This day, I couldn't get him home. We worked through the through the lunchtime to get this project done by four o'clock in the afternoon, and um, he lost it yeah. around uh, one o'clock in the afternoon because he did not get. For three years, he worked for me, and he always went home for lunch. He lived at River Run, 
and uh, this one day, he lost it. Oh. And um, so I scooped him up out the back door of the building, and, um, and he explained to me what was going on. And I brought him out of Carlson uh, recovery. Topped him off with 50 bucks worth of quarters and for the machines. And um, then he uh, did well, came out, worked for me for about six more months. He and his girlfriend packed up. They moved to Florida, and I got an email. A week later, he died, OD'd. Oh, no. Yep. From Williamsburg, I've known him all my life. And uh, great family, great kid. Not a struggling family. Um, so I, 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 I understand exactly what you're saying. Well, Carlson Recovery is a great place. Unfortunately, there's not enough in tax beds in it. In, yeah. the, in the whole region. Yeah. There's, there's only Carlson and there's Providence um, for our clients. And, you know, when someone like that is ready, when you, you, you know, they'll come into the drop in and I can just see the look on their face and I'll yeah. get them into my office and, and try to talk them into a detox. Mm -hmm. and, and when they say yes, because they don't, you know, it's not very often they say yes. No. Well, then the frustrating part is trying to get a detox. Right? Get and it's just, and, and when you can't get it, you lose it. And, and that's one of the real tragedies. Yeah. When, when they're ready, there's nothing there for them. Either Garvey or Mellon would I'd get yeah. somebody and they'd just look at me and they'd say, good luck. <laughs> but, uh, but hey, it's worth it. It's worth it. Some, some have turned out very well, and they are now my competition. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the fundraising. Mm -hmm. So um, the fundraising event that we have every year at um, the beginning of December is called the Evening Cult, and we are, have decided to experiment this year um, and not have that event because we are using our sharing our stories to raise awareness of the whole agency as opposed to trying to target fundraising to a specific part of the agency and so we're going to try to focus all our energies on a, um, a spring event we haven't set the date yet but it will probably be a breakfast um, and it will have an inspirational programming uh, be about an hour long um, and um, we're going to stick with that model for this year and see how it goes. So you're canceling off Evening of Hope. You're not mm -hmm. going to do that anymore. We might do it sometime in the future, but this year um, we want to focus on one thing and put all our energy into it okay. and um, try to raise money for the whole organization because we have now been working to raise awareness in the community more than we ever have before. And we hope that there are more people now that would come to an event for the whole agency and it's going to be, we're not going to ask for a specific ticket price. We're, we're not going to put have a ticket price. We're just going to ask people to come and hear some stories and a video and um, and whatever they're moved to give, to give a, an amount of their own choice. And, but to fill up a large room full of people and hopefully raise more money. And then this would be a breakfast, and you're not sure yet. It's too early, right? I'm pretty sure it's a breakfast. Um, no, Council at Large, Bill Dwight mentioned to me way back because we were mentioning about an area that we were thinking of doing a fundraiser at one point and he said, you know, Mary, go to Smith School. Are they still doing that? Though? What, the? the? Where you could go ahead and use them as caterers there? Well, the Smith Vocational provides catering services for, for nonprofits. Oh. And he highly recommended that. Well, the, the, they also have a space. They have a, right. They have a dining hall. Some, which is called particularly elegant, but there's it's actually a lot of uh, senior citizens actually gather there yes. every week. For but it's it's a pretty large space. It looks like a looks like a school, but the fact is that I mean, if you pack, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know. Depending on how you're angling your your donors, I mean, I understand that on, on one hand, um, sometimes donors love to be wooed in elegance. I don't think that's your donor base, no, but I think actually, it's no. so. So I think, you know, that's not a terrible idea. Smith Vocational is the space, actually. Uh, the food and services be, be provided, I think, pretty mm -hmm. nominal and cheap. And, uh, you know, center of town, plenty of parking. Mm -hmm. We've had, We've had, some, great, thing there, We've had some great feeds there. Mm. And what, do you know what their capacity is? About 300, I think it is. That may be, yeah. Mm. That's oh. possible, yeah. It's a big space. And, and so it's a dual purpose of training yeah. the students on, sure. and um, food prep presentation and, and, and delivery, so and processing and ordering and everything else. So they do it from top to bottom, and, and principally because they're being trained towards 
some of the trains for catering services, that might be the... You know, There's also a little stage area there. There is a stage, the and they even have an amp system. All right, here, yeah. here you go. Really? Well, so it looks like <laughs> put him right on the stage. I'm just, it's volunteering me for everything. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, the stage looks like a school stage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It has, there's a quaintness about it that's not I just said, and we might need an MC. There, you, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Another hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because his voice is good. Yeah. There you go. He's a great I'll just hide you. <laughs> Come on down. Oh, that's, that's a really interesting idea. Thank you. Yeah. I think it would it be. It was very anti just Keep them in mind. <laughs> Keep Smith Vocational in mind. I think that's an excellent, excellent idea. Plus, you are helping also bringing in people and supporting our Smith Vocational School. And you guys obviously have your work cut out for fundraising in this climate in these days, in these circumstances. The pool gets drier and drier. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, how anyway. much did you get cut, Susan, in ServiceNet as far um, as money? How much have you lost? We've only lost small. Um, small grants, you know, but it sort of eats away. Um, we lost some of the sheltering, uh, actually, the shelter and housing areas where we lost um, a few different little pieces that support. The whole shelter and housing division is cobbled together with, uh, I don't know, I think we have about 30 different funding sources all together that, shelter Sunday, that support, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That support our, um, <laughs> our 10 programs. and. It's a little bit, you know, the small federal grant, another small state, and there's different state agencies that support us. So a couple of those were, were cut. The family shelter, the latest thing that we just found out about is that our family shelter, the Greenfield Family Inn up in Greenfield, is getting cut. We have to lay off one staff person. Um, and we're already bare bones, which, and we have a phenomenal, we have a guy who runs that place who, um, he'll just work harder and fill in. You know, he will. He just, um, he's phenomenal. He's been running that place for probably 20 years or something. Wow, that's a long time. You know, I can't imagine Northampton without service, man. I just can't. Yeah, well, we're not I just can't. Away. No, I know that, but I mean, just, I, you know, before, I, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's a great operation. It really is something. Yeah. It provides a huge, a huge need. So that's the reason, one of the reasons we're trying to ramp up our fundraising is that um, we don't know what the future holds and we just need to get more fans and <laughs> more supporters. Yeah. And, you know, you get a lot of people donating a little and it adds up. Um, and hopefully somewhere in the crowd is some, you know, secret millionaire who's going <laughs> to... I know a lot of people are looking for that person. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know that, that person's the most wanted person in town. Exactly. <laughs> you know that book, The Millionaire Next Door? Apparently there's a lot more people that are sitting on money. Well, than according to Mitt Romney, middle, middle income is $250,000 a year. So. Well, isn't that great? I guess I'm down in poverty. We'll take some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in mean, poverty. The world sounds like a... Yeah, the middle class <laughs> <and long laughs> <time. laughs> We've been living in poverty on North Maple Street all of my life. <laughs> so. so please let us know Yes. If when you're going to be doing that breakfast. Mm -hmm. And if you can please give us heads up yeah. early. Because okay. counselors, we pick up like crazy yeah, of invitations so. and stuff. And oh, please look at my colleague. Oh, for being the MC. Okay. Voice is oh, excellent, and I think. <laughs> I'm kinda, no, I'm serious. I've known him as a colleague for a long time, and I've seen him, and he'll generate some good action there. <laughs> <laughs> there you, go. you guys are looking for action. <laughs> yes, you <he> will. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll sit there right in the front and watch him. And he'll be going. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope to nail down a date soon. I wanted to mention that even though we are focusing on one S event, we are, we are creating a shelter Sunday, which is October Sunday, yes, and we love to that's October fourteenth. Fourteenth. Yeah. Um, bless your heart, we're trying to get counselors, ward counselors involved, and uh, yeah, um, uh, Marianne awesome. has volunteered, uh, Pamela Schwartz has volunteered to <coughs> to coordinate um, so far, and we're back from some of the other counselors, but it's early yet, and. Yeah. Um, when he emailed us, I emailed him right back, and I said, I'll help out. They've never asked me for signs. Do you need a sign? Yes. I already, Bill and I put that request in for my She's front lawn. She's talked to Rick 
talk about the and I think he's going to keep me on the list, please, because my site is a good site. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually in my next letter I'll CC you on the board okay. so that we can, if it, if at the very best, shame some of them. That works. <laughs> <laughs> like Yankee shame. It's a lot to be set for it. When Thank did you. the shelter start opening? November 1st. November 1st? Yeah, the seasonal shelters open November 1st. Oh. And shut down the last day of April. Just the Grove is open year round. Grove is open year round. Yeah. It was cold enough this morning to need shelter. Mm -hmm. It's 41. The emergency yeah. Do you? Do you feel that you should come in and talk to us about the opening of the shelters, yeah. the one over by the police station? I mean, we already know about Grove Street. Okay. Do you want to come in and talk about them? Look, I'm not sure if I would be the one to come in and talk, but I could Wanda? discuss it with Wanda and mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, Wanda. I, I mean, have to I mean talk Wanda, Wanda would. I mean the. Get Wanda come in with you. I, mean, I think. I think, as you pointed out, Mike, I think I think your winter's going to be pretty busy. Uh, mm -hmm. The shelter systems are going to be really we, overburdened. We've, been, we've been, been busier than we've ever been in yeah. the last six months. Ever. Wow. I, th I think, I, I don't see that dying down, for at least for the season anyway, so. Wow. I suspect that. Are we going to have enough of room? Could you tell Peg the good news about the, you know the good Peg news? Peg the waiting list. The good news about the traffic? The road. extension. Oh, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Well, the news is that we just we can stay where we are for oh, another, another year. Yeah. Where down here? Yeah, for the yeah. drop the drop in the drop in site. We thought we had to leave that yeah. site where the drop in was, and we were negotiating with the church, and it was going to be more money than we could possibly raise to to renovate the church, and we were kind of getting desperate, and we decided to have one more um, attempt, make one more attempt to see if the landlord would let us stay. Another year. That would have been a disaster. On Center Street. Yeah. 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 So we're going to be where yeah. we are now. Yeah. And, you know, maybe even longer, but definitely for a year. Hmm. So How was the renovation of the police station interfered with your... I don't know. Uh, it, it really didn't. Yeah. Uh, we, like I said, we, we have been so busy. People still are still coming. And yeah. Just so many newer people. You know, just I believe it. I see yeah. new faces on Main Street. All oh, just kids. so many well, new people. You, you know what, spe and, you know what that John. speaks to on some level also, Mike, I shouldn't be, pass it out of notice, is the yeah. fact that the, the quality and the availability of service. Mm -hmm. A lot of communities are actually coming up short, and mm -hmm. Northampton seems to come up solid every time. So when you're in search and casting around trying to find a community that actually supports and sustain you, I mean, it's unfortunately for you, it's a testimony to how good you guys have been doing yeah. what you're doing. But, that, and, but it also corresponds with the growing census of people at risk. Yeah. And um, it's not improving really anytime soon, and it is not a coincidence that funding also is plummeting at the same time. And that's, mm -hmm. that's literally the political will. So that's our job. We're supposed to present the political will, so. Yes. But, but to, to your credit, that's why. You know, it sucks. The better you do, the harder it gets, right? That's it. So, but thank goodness for you guys. So. And look at Soup Kitchen. I mean, they come from. He comes for money, and it's the same amount of money all the time. And oh, Peg, man. you're my witness to it. I said to him, "When are you going to ask us for a little bit more?" Well, good thing it wasn't this year. <laughs> Well, I don't imagine that CDBG funds are going to be expanding the next round. I, I doubt it. I don't think we're going to have very much money. Uh, anyway. What do you think, Pat? There's a presidential election looming. That's right. No predictions. Yeah, but there's also a Senate election, yeah. congressional yeah, election, congressional that, election. Mm -hmm. that actually holds the holds sway over the existence of and the viability of and as I said, sequestration. So we'll see it's, what it's, happens. And anyway, it's seven o'clock, and then some. And you guys, have, you were scheduled an hour and a half ago, I think. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And I'd like to talk to you about the heroin in the schools. It's like talking to. Mike probably knows more about the details of.
what's going on than I do. I just am on the periphery of it, but I can't. I can hardly stand to go to the last time I went to the staff meeting at the drop-in. They were talking about these young girls. They weren't even sure if they were uh, how old they were. They thought they were like 16 or something. And they were hanging around with older guys who were luring them in. And, uh, you know, as they were speaking, these people's lives were like going down the drain outside, and they, would, uh, they couldn't it, do anything. It is a tragedy, better. and we're seeing it every day. Um, I'll probably bring it back up again then. I'm when did sure. you actually um, notice this increase? No, I, I just, don't know. In the, just in the last six months. Well, okay, really. because that's what I shelter. wanted yeah. to know. <laughs> Heroin's because, been around for a long time. Yeah. Yes, but it was but, not a problem when we had Karen Jean, Karen Jarvis Vance, and um, Johnson come in. When they did their survey, it was, was probably, what, a good year and a half ago. It was not a problem at the high school. It was. I, don't I, say, I don't either. I wanted huh. to say that. I mean, it wasn't a problem that they were. I knew it was a problem. The, they were focusing on substance they, use in total. Yeah. And they're focusing on alcohol, yes. smoking, marijuana, marijuana, but also, but also all associated drugs, pharmaceuticals, yes, everything right. that. It, it, the magic panoply of things that we take and ingest to alter our consciousness, and, yeah. and which comes with readily available, and so that's that's what their program is. is uh, Heroin is easy to get. It's, it's cheap. It's, it's really, I don't even know what it's it cheap, looks relatively like. Speaking, Heroin as a product is perfect <laughs> compared to like the the, the, yeah. the cocaine, the designer, the yeah. the, the, the big the stuff. The kids have no idea what they're getting into. No. They have no clue where it's going to take because it's going to take them to the worst place. Without a doubt, it's going to take them to jail, it's going to take them to homelessness, or it's going to kill them. It's going to kill them. What does it look like? You say powder? Yeah, it's a white powder. And they shoot it up, they inject it. So you're also talking about HIV, hepatitis C, all that. They also snort it. Which they do. I have to catch a press. All right. Thank you very much. I, I knew it. I'm shocked with that. I knew that is not what we were told. No, nope. but I knew that years ago. Watched it. And Michael Barnsley is the thing. Unbelievable. But our, our own man is like, we don't have a drug problem. Yep. It's a huge problem. It's, the it's, 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 it's ginormous. That, no, I want to ask Karen Jarvis and Benson about that. Right? It's, it's ginormous. I mean, when you come in front of a TV, when we make laws, right, but you have to remember who pays them. Remember how mad they were at me? <laughs> so I'm still filming. Are we adjourned yet? Oh, no. Are you coming well, November 15th with, <laughs> me. with I mean, Judith I mean, Roberts? Is it's illegal. Uh, it's, it's we got Mary Claire. It's, Judith is coming in at 6 o'clock. Mary Claire is coming in at 530. That's the worst thing that could happen and then, and then, and then it's, it's Thank you. beyond See it, all the other okay. social problems are minimal, minimal. Yeah. And Heroin, on the other hand. Is, and alcohol is the, the one thing that's legal is worse than alcohol marijuana. and smoking are responsible. Smoking is responsible for 500,000 deaths a year. Smoking alcohol is, is, is 40,000 deaths I a year. I smoke. Yeah, yeah. Really but it's, 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 it Not is. Not that much, though. Well, it's, See, it's, but Intelligent the, people are cutting back, at least. You know? <laughs> really? Well, even, but. The intelligent people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're an intelligent person. You go person. to the University Mass, I have friends who are professors. They can't at smoke Smith, anymore on the campus. No, and at, and they are Mars. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it, it, it's, it is, and you're right. And, and Do it you want to come to one of, we're doing um, tobacco cessation classes for our staff? I can't wear patches. No, the, oh. they don't. You don't have to wear patches. But this council. It's just a group. Um, yeah. I'm just a, discussing statistics. Yeah. Oh, you just have to quit. I, I think I've done very, very well. I've cut yeah. down yeah. Well, I'm doing it myself because I'm so allergic yeah. uh, to so many types of medications yeah. and stuff. I mean, even with my Graves' disease, mm -hmm. you no, know, that pork handles all that. But um. We're not adjourned. So yeah. we're, this we're is all tape. Oh, come on. Oh, my God. I'm on, I, I would I'm actually on the record saying that I believe no, in legalizing all drugs. <laughs> no. I, I didn't want to interfere with Susan talking, but we need to move on. with this. Well, so, okay. Not a problem, honey. Susan, so thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for coming. Public comment, and I want to talk about the agenda for the month of um, October. <laughs> <laughs> um,
We have Thank Mary you, Claire Higgins, and Corinne yeah. is going to notify her on a reminder to be here right. this we'll time. Um, You've got her scheduled twice, though, haven't you? Yes, from Community um, Actions. And um, Judith Roberts from the Literacy Project is coming, and we're hoping that the graduating yeah. class who just received their GEGs and so forth might be a friend of mine. That's me. I, I, that's me. I got my GED through uh, the Literacy Project. But we don't know what what's going to happen here. She's going to notify me this week. Right. So I'll move that we adjourn. I'll second that. Favor? Aye. Aye. Click. I love it when these guys from the Veterans Council comes in. <laughs> it's